the squirrel had come into the unit and chased another roommate around and then Scott put up, or his handy person, I don't know, um, put up a mesh screen, but hadn't like done the plastering over it. So they put a painting over it. Uh, you know, Scooby, the Scooby-Doo episodes where the eyeballs and the painting are moving. Those eyeballs were a squirrel. At one point, a light fell on your head. You pulled the, the cord. Oh, chain. Yep. The light fell on your head and you had to get stitches in your head. Staples. We were trying to get heat in the apartment. Um, Scott was just evasive and sort of saying things that weren't turning into action. It was really unclear if we would get any heat, other tenant moved out because their toilet bowl froze solid. So you have a big gaping hole in the side of the house. Is that accurate? There were tarps. <laughs> you have such low standards for your housing. I mean, there were tarps. One other roommate and I were both at home and there was pounding on both the front and the back doors and, and neither of us felt comfortable going and answering really loud pounding. Another unit did and then came and talked to us and let us know that it was somebody serving papers for a foreclosure notice. Scott's strengths were not highlighted in his role as a landlord with that kind of responsibility over people's well-being, over, over our safety, our comfort, you know, our sense of home, and... You're being too kind. You use the phrase, his strengths were not highlighted, <laughs> to wrap this up. <laughs> his strengths were not highlighted. You've described some horrible conditions that you lived through, so it's very kind of you to say his strengths were not highlighted. <laughs> I am concerned that this, that the role of city council member is outside of what is good for either the city of Minneapolis or honestly for Scott himself. We're rolling. We're rolling. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now. So this is an unusual topic for me, but I've never done like a this style of episode, so I want to be smooth about it. Yeah. What style is this? Talking to people about a a bad experience they had. It's usually candidates. You don't usually do the trauma thing. No. <laughs> so if I if I'm insensitive at any point. If you make me cry yeah. by bringing up things that are, are hard in my life. I edit the episode so I can edit those okay. parts out. Here we are on the Wedge Live podcast for a different style of episode. We're here in Kenwood Park. I'm joined by my friend Julia Curran to talk about her experiences as a tenant with her landlord of 12, 12 years ago now. Is that when it was? That's when it ended, yeah. Scott Graham, who was running for city council in Ward 7, and full disclosure, I'm already not a fan, fan of Scott Graham. Uh, Julia's had bad experiences with Scott Graham as a tenant, and so is probably not a fan of Scott Graham. And so, uh, full disclosure, know where we're coming from, but also, uh, Julia's told me these stories over the years as a friend, I can vouch for that, and also I have reviewed old emails between you and Scott Graham and some of your your housemates and so I feel confident that everything that's about to be said in this episode is true. Yes I want to clarify that I am not a fan of Scott Graham as a person in a position of power over me. I got along fine with him in casual conversations and um, we had enough overlapping interests that I you know that was a totally fine those were interactions that I appreciated as an extrovert and um, somebody who was you know, working from home occasionally, but it was, it was a lot of the interaction specifically around um, his role of responsibility and the power dynamic right. that where um, I did not appreciate his behavior. He had a position of power over you as, as a landlord. Your housing depended on uh, him. Very much. So how long were you a tenant of Scott Graham's? Um, over four years. Okay. And that ended in 2011? Yes. So it, during the election, it's come out that he's had like 200 some housing violations. And one of his, he put out a statement explaining them. And the explanation was, well, I was a property manager 
for other owners and I was responsible. I was going in to fix the problems, but this was a house that he owned, right? I should, I believe he owned it. We sent rent, each of the units sent rent to a different um, entity. One was his wife, one was another name, um, Walter Investments, and then the third was to him. I, I honestly do not, do not recall if I checked it, if it was both him and his wife or just him, so. So I looked at the mortgage, the foreclosure document okay, that I you sent me. I looked back at that. And it was his wife and him listed okay, on the foreclosure document. Yeah. So he did own the house. Yeah. So what kind of housing was it? This was a house with multiple units? A triplex. On Colfax Avenue in the Wedge. Yes. And you lived with roommates, housemates? Yes. I had two roommates. I moved in to replace somebody who was moving in with her girlfriend. And um, it was one of, you know, I found it on Craigslist, um, was, uh, looking for some place on bus lines. And this is over four years. Mm -hmm. And what, kind, what kinds of problems did you have living there over the years? The, the first big problem that I found out about was that there was a consistent issue with um, the heat. And previous winters, people had had to sort of hunker down in the rooms with space heaters. So, um, when I was moving in, we were looking at, well, I hadn't experienced a winter yet, but the, the other two roommates were wanting to um, finally get that addressed. And so that was sort of the first thing to come up. There were a couple of other things that I was, became aware of, but um, like there, when one of the roommate who was leaving was picking up a painting, it turned out had been covering a hole in the wall that a squirrel had chewed through. So, it's a, and- It's a house of horrors. Typical of Scott, it was not like, fully repaired, the squirrel had come into the unit and chased another roommate around and then Scott put up, or his handy person, I don't know, um, put up a mesh screen, but hadn't like done the plastering over it. So they put a painting over it. It's like the, you know, Scooby the Scooby-Doo episodes where the eyeballs and the painting are moving. Those eyeballs were a squirrel. It, a squirrel actually did after the one chewed through, another one came up to look through the hole in the wall and freaked a roommate out. Okay. I didn't, I was not privy to seeing the squirrels in that location. I'm sorry for laughing at your trauma. I was not the one hiding from the squirrels. They were, they, I did not see them. They were just in my ceiling all the time. So reading, I read through the emails and some of the messages are from your housemates. Some of them are from you. Some of them are from Scott Graham. And mm -hmm. it sounds like there's just a ton of problems going on with this house and things aren't getting fixed in a timely manner and they're not getting fixed properly in a way yeah. that makes them stay fixed. Yeah, it was also really unclear. We'd hear things were gonna get fixed and then they wouldn't get fixed and it, there you, was not clear communication. How did you let Graham know about the problems? Is this mostly by email? Did you see him when he came by? Did you call him? How did you communicate the problems to him? For me, it was probably when he came by and via email most, but um, the, I had four roommates over that time period, um, and the roommates that I moved in with first, I know sometimes used the phone as well. And so did you have a sense of how many properties he owned or was managing at the time? Is this like a guy with a big portfolio and you're just like one of many properties he's managing, or are you just his one side business that he's coming over and handling? Um, I'm not entirely sure. The first year I was there, I believe it was the first year, he was actually not living in Minneapolis, um, which seemed to be an issue because there wasn't a clear line of like how to get things addressed. Um, he was, I think, in New York for the year. And um, at some point he did reference another property. Um, I think he was gonna do something with that one so that he could get the money to pay on the foreclosure. But um, I, I wasn't sure anything about him um, as a landlord aside from he seemed to have a lot of different cars that he'd show up in. Oh, we got a lot of cars. I, I mean, I don't know if they were his, if he was, but he very often, you know, would have a different. Well, he's a real you know. estate agent. You have to impress with the car you I, drive. Yeah, I, think. I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go through a series of things that stood out to me that were problems with your uh, residence. Uh, so a, at a, one point, a light fell on your head. You pulled the. The cord, chain. Yep. the light fell on your head and you had to get stitches in your head. 
Staples. Staples. Yeah, it was a, um, a heavy glass globe. This is a problem you were aware of previously or just kind of did you? I was aware of it when something broke on my head. Are you, that's the first time you're aware of the problem with this light. Did you contact Scott after that happened or I, before it happened? I did not. I mean, I didn't know it was loose. I didn't right. know it hadn't been properly right. installed until it fell on my head. And I was really glad I wasn't looking up because it was really heavy. Um, I did end up contacting him after that just because um, it seemed to be, you know, a, a, I didn't know who did the installation, but it was clearly poorly installed. It wasn't something that we were doing. And um, so I did let him know. Um, was he responsive in, in fixing that? Uh, honestly, I don't remember what happened, like if he replaced it or what. I did suggest maybe a plastic one since CFLs don't get as hot. Um, and I had to push him to get him to respond because I did ask him to pay for my co-pays. Um, right. So did he pay for your copays? I yeah. He he asked in one email about like let me know if there are any more leaks. Uh, it seemed like leaks were an issue in the house. So can you describe those problems? Um, I am. Yeah, there were definitely ice dams that were an occurrence. Um, I'm trying to think of. I think those were that was the predominant. Well, I'm assuming it was ice dams, but I'm not sure because towards the end, we had so many carpenter ants. And when we were reading up on them at first, we were like, are we, you know, we were putting food away. We were trying to figure out why we still had them, why there were, I, I killed seven um, queens in my bedroom in one evening. So it felt like the little, you know, the fairy tale about the, the tailor um, who kills seven flies. And it, as I was reading more about it, it was like, it's not about anything we're doing. There's something, you know, it's right. something that's not good about the structure of the house or there's something that needs addressing. And so I don't know if, there was additional water damage happening elsewhere or if it was more serious. I just kind of assumed it was ice dams because, you know, um, some of it was happening in the winter. So when you uh, communicated about the leaks, did he fix the leaks? Not that I'm recalling. Just kind of let them go. It didn't, he, yeah, he, he didn't seem, he didn't, he seemed less concerned than I was for the, um, integrity of the, the structure. Was it kind of a, let me know if the leaks get worse kind of thing, but no, they're fine for now? I remember having the sense of like, you're kind of bothering me. I think I texted him about it initially and then also, you know, sent an email, but it was just one of those where it was like, like I, you know, ice dams happen, it's in Minnesota. And I had lived in a house um, where we had them and we were trying to deal with them immediately. And it was like a holiday and, you know, somebody out on the roof trying to, um, out the window a little doing things so to me i thought it was a thing that you don't want happening and you kind of address urgently but it didn't seem to be something that was bothering him dead animals uh, yeah. these squirrels you think were the, there's a dead was, animal smell that i read about in the emails yes um that was the the closet that shared a wall with where the squirrel had chewed through so that was what we suspected but we never found out um when we raised the issue with scott he brought over an ozone machine, which is not, you know, those are an ozone generator and they're pretty dangerous. They're not really supposed to be used outside of like industrial spaces because of the dangers of ozone for humans. Um, so we never used it and just did not use that closet. The missing wall. So this is something that Naomi Kritzer wrote about in her. So it was in a Twitter thread you did years ago. She wrote about it in her Ward 7 candidate write up and came to the conclusion Scott Graham is a nightmare. Uh, so tell me, uh, how did the missing wall come about? When we were trying to get heat in the apartment, um, Scott was just evasive and sort of saying things that weren't turning into action. It was really unclear if we would get any heat. We had some, um, the other roommates who'd been there longer had suggestions of like, maybe if we can't get the heat replaced, we could do some sort of, you know, the landlord covers part of the electric so that we can run the space heaters. Um, and we'd done the things like putting the plastic, this is a long answer, but plastic over windows, all of that. So um, when that, none of that was, Scott was not responsive. And we ended up trying to figure out what else we could do. Um, talked to the city, found out that one option to really put pressure on possibly, since we weren't getting a response in any other way, was to um, look into putting rent into escrow or, or starting an inspection process. So I, that was by far not our first choice. You know, it had been, it had been months um, of, and an ongoing issue for years. One other tenant moved out because their toilet bowl fro froze solid. So um, we did end up getting the city involved and the city did an inspection, a, which revealed, you know, additional um, 
additional violations, including the three season porch on the front, um, which led to um, the wall coming off. So the thing you didn't even complain about, the city shows up to inspect the thing you were complaining about, finds more problems, mm -hmm. uh, and that turns into a big repair job for... I mean, it was... Repair would be really an understatement. It was a demolition job. There was... I came home one evening and there was like a dumpster sitting on the bush in the front. Um, and it, it, I kind of wish I had pictures because it was just like at the weirdest angle. People... It, yeah, there was the demolition of the porch and... Um, so you have a big gaping hole in the side of the house. Is that accurate? There were tarps. <laughs> you have such low standards for your house. I mean, there were tarps. <laughs> I, you know, we grew up, we moved around a lot. We lived in a tent for three months in Bemidji. You know, I, I, the family house was in Ward 7, but there were other places we lived that... You're used to roughing it. You know, it's... I... Yes and no. I think the unpredictability was what was hard. If we knew how long the tarps would be up, if there were clear, like, um, if I knew that, that there'd be a house shaking and I'd look out the window and there'd be, you know, what looked like teen boys in a Jeep with a chain attached to the old one pulling it down. <laughs> it, a lot of it was like the lack of transparency. That was the, the demolition process? Teen boys in a Jeep I did not ask them their ages. That was just my read on it when I was looking out the window and uh, that's, trying to that's figure out how my house will, was shaking. That's how they'll play it in the Scott Graham movie, is teen, <laughs> teen boys in a Jeep pulling the wall off the house it was, that he owns. I mean, they looked like they might have been enjoying it. How long did the gaping hole covered by tarps in your home uh, go on for? How long did you have this hole exposed to the elements? Again, tarp, perfect text from elements, that's what it's for. Um, it was, so it started in April. We were not given, we didn't know what was even being built, honestly. Like, at some point I asked one of the people who was overdoing some of the work if, if um, he knew what Scott was planning, because we, we weren't privy to that information. The porch finally went up in early September, and then there was still finish, or still walls, doors, um, I think things were finishing up by November and then the door continued, the doors continued to blow open in the winter. Um, I'm interpreting from some of the emails I've, I've read that you sent me that there's like, maybe towards the end, you're, there's this tone of this, Scott is retaliating against us because we're, I think you used the phrase squeaky wheel, we've caused him problems by complaining about the issues with this house, now he's mad at us. Was that dynamic something you were conscious of the time you rented with them? The point, I don't think, I wasn't when I started, to be clear. And I was also a sublease initially. I became the senior member in that, that unit and um, tried to get a, Scott, a lease from Scott, but he, he would say it was in the mail. I never received anything. Um, never I had a lease the whole time you were there? I had a sublease from the person who... Okay who I moved in with initially. And then when I became the primary person, um, I was supposed to have a lease with Scott, which he said he would get to me and never got to me. And then in April um, was saying that he'd had some sort of computer failure and lost all of his leases, which I, at the time I was like, oh, it just, it, it made sense based on, you know, he just did not seem cut out for this level of responsibility. Yeah, I read that. I w he's like asking your housemates for leases because his hard drive failed. And you say you never got a lease. And I had eventually given up asking. I asked him in person. Um, the other roommate who I was taking over from was asking. He did verify via email that I would be, that I was aware that I would be responsible for the entirety of the, the rent um, as the primary person on it. But I, I never did receive that. He never did a walkthrough with, with me when I moved in or with the other people when they moved in. And that was something that, you know, we all kind of, we thought should happen, but it was, there were often more requests than it was feasible to ask about. And given the delay in responding to them, things just, you know, you'd stop asking about things. Also in the emails that I read that at the end, it seems like uh, there's a foreclosure. I've seen the document. Uh, how did you learn about this? Is this what forced you out of the house that it got foreclosed on? Was he not paying his mortgage? I, that's how foreclosure works, right? That, you're, not, you're not paying your mortgage. 
<laughs> That's my understanding of foreclosure. We found out one other roommate and I were both at home and there was pounding on both the front and the back doors and, and um, neither of us felt comfortable going and answering really loud pounding. Um, eventually one of the other people in another unit did and then came and talked to us and let us know that it was somebody serving papers with for a foreclosure notice. Um, where I learned that one of the roommates who had moved out had paid more to him in rent than he had paid on the mortgage. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know what was, what all was going on with that, but um, he assured us first that it wasn't going to be an issue. He was going to just pay it up. Um, I think that happened in May, but in mid-June, I believe, he told us that he wanted us out by end of July. And the other, it was, you know, there was a lot of um, uncertainty around all of this because there were different messages being given to the people in different units, but it turned out he only wanted um, our unit gone. He said that he thought that he might have people moving in, you know, whoever bought it might want to live on that floor. And this was after telling us he was planning on paying for it. So it was, the, the story just kept changing. And then after we moved out, he was looking for paint to finally, um, uh, you know, to cover up some stuff and, um, I believe it was the water damage, but I uh, would want to just double check that. But um, because he was showing the unit for other people to rent. Mm -hmm. So the, the story of why we were being asked to move to change. Have I skipped through anything that was like wrong with the, your housing that he wasn't addressing or was taking a long time to address? Have I skipped any over, over any of those big issues before I get to like the end of your... I mean, I wasn't the only person who needed um, medical attention. I, another roommate needed stitches from something that was poorly installed. Um, I broke, a stair broke under my feet in the back where there was a railing. Um, I mean, the stairs were deteriorating and um, we'd raised that concern, hadn't had it ad addressed. Um, at one point, somebody had just moved into another unit and was turning on the oven to heat up a pizza and it set off the huge alarm, you know, the one that's apartment buildings have that's very flashy lights. And um, it was really hard getting a hold of him to find out how to shut it off. And then his suggestion to the person was that they um, unplug the fire alarm. Um, it seems right, it seems right to me. I've never been a landlord, but that's how I'd do it. I would have felt a lot more comfortable if it had not been a structure that already right this house seems like a death trap and I, he's like turn off the fire alarm i honestly did have in my mind sometimes um you know with storms moving through like I, it yeah it was it was have your escape route planned. kind of yeah yeah so foreclosure comes and you're all leaving anything about like the process of him evicting you from this house that stands out to you i it, it just Altogether, the fact that he asked, he said he didn't get me a lease. The lease, um, he said his computer failed sometime in April. It, it kind of felt like it was setting it up to make sure that we didn't have, um, you know, enough information to kind of push back against um, being um, pushed out. And he did, it was not much time that he was giving us. We were asking about you know, additional time, he sort of went back and forth, but that was kind of how things went um, with him generally. So yeah, it was just, it was a, a very stressful process. He also was, um, he had not done, the tenancy in the unit that I was in, you know, could be traced back through a number of people, probably pushing a dozen different people. And I don't think he'd done walkthroughs between people. Um, so there were things that had, I had, you know, I'd never seen before in the basement. I never put anything in the basement. He's he getting, was he's assuming very, we were... He's getting very upset in the emails. Yeah. That there are things in the basement and like problems wrong with the unit. And there are tenants who you have shared the home with who have moved out, who were, who had leases and, uh, didn't do walkthroughs with them to see if the damage was on them. And so you, as the last tenants in the home, as you move out, he's like, well, this is on you guys. Well, it was also things that he had never fixed that were called out in the inspection. Right. So that was, you know, the, the lack of um, just sort of how some of the things in the kitchen were not ever finished in a renovation, um, things like that, that were, you know, he was charging us for replacements of it, it was very, very bizarre. One of the things, which was pretty minor, but that appeared on the inspection thing was just like the lack of um, electrical outlet covers 
in a lot of places in the apartment, including the kitchen. And I had, I had myself gone and gotten some and installed them because he wasn't getting around to it. And I did some painting and stuff. And so it was, it was really odd to see him just the, yeah. The nickel and diming at the end, I saw the invoice that he sends you on this email chain with you and the people you lived with. And the way he's nickel and diming you for electrical plates, and you say like some of these, these plates, some of these outlets and switches didn't have covers to begin with. And you uh, went out of your way, digged, dug into your pockets for quarters and dimes and nickels <laughs> to buy these very cheap items. Yeah, I don't remember if it was in the email or, or in a different means where he was trying to say that they were like five or I, the price he had for them was just like, I literally he had three, bought them. He had were. three columns in the invoice. Yeah. One is like uh, cost of the item, then the install, then procurement. And then I don't know if it was you or someone else is like, Scott, uh, you told me you have these things in your basement. Are you charging us a p- procurement cost? That to was go me. down into your it was, basement. I had checked with him. You know, I'm I'm somebody who I I know that it when I'm renting, it is not my structure. And I know that well intentioned people still do things that like I try and check with people before I do things to a building. I want it to be able to serve the next renters for however long or what have you. So I checked with him when there was something that I wanted, a medicine cabinet that I asked to remove and he verified it. He was there. I was, he was working in the basement the day I took it down. I pointed it out to him again when during some of the moving out process and then he was still trying to charge us for, for it. It was really bizarre. There's something weird going on with Scott Graham because it was like 90 something dollars between the three of you. Clearly he has run a, a shoddy landlording operation. This is a house that's been in disrepair the whole time you've lived there. And at the end, he's not like, well, you owe me $2,500 for all of these things. He's like, well, there's a missing tile here and the, the plates on the electrical outlets are not up to my standards. And uh, figure out what you owe me. It's $90 total. Just decide amongst yourselves what you are going to pay me. Very weird nickel and diming when you'd think he would be feeling bad about the foreclosure that happened and all the things that are in poor condition, the missing wall. There didn't seem to be much empathy. That was one of the bizarre bits. Um, There just wasn't, it it was like he he didn't see that landlording means that there are people whose well-being, whose stability of their home, their safety, their comfort depends on you and and how you fulfill those responsibilities. And I've had since then, thank goodness, I've had, you know, good landlords and who are responsive, who, who know that what happens in your unit under their watch can inconvenience you, who have, when something has gone wrong without me asking, offered to take money off of my rent for the inconvenience of a shower that didn't work for a couple of days or, or what have you. And just the, the detachment that Scott had consistently between this responsibility and the impacts that it had between his responsibility and the the structure that was his investment property and it you know it seemed later like it was just that he just saw, given that he didn't pay he didn't even one person of the sort of the of the three units one one person in the three bedroom unit paid more in rent over the course of his ownership than he paid on the mortgage like he wasn't using i don't know i the money wasn't going back into the house. No, there wasn't. It, it seemed like he saw the, the building as a way for him to get money. Yeah. He didn't see it as a mutual relationship um, between tenants and landlord with the building sort of at the center of it. It was it, really, really strange. It doesn't even seem like he saw his uh, home that he owned that he was renting out, his business, as uh, something as an asset to be taken care of, not, not even taking care of you. He wasn't taking care of this yeah. property in a way that would keep it a viable uh, concern. Yeah, I, my father was a civil engineer. I am somebody who, I, I have very place-based memories. I am attached to, you know, the buildings that I live in and I, I felt like I cared a lot more about it than he did and, and that was sad to me. Also when, so this move out uh, ordeal where he's nickel and diming you, there was a broken tile and I think you described how like the tile broke because it was not, there was nothing behind it. Like it wasn't really attached to anything. Maybe it was attached to things on the side, but like yeah, you could push on it 
and it would uh, kind of break because there's nothing behind it. Yeah, and it was, he was trying to charge you for that. He did. I mean, he did charge. I I didn't. Yeah, he did charge us for that. And it wasn't even a lot of money. That's what I don't get. Like he's not trying to scam you. It felt necessarily, petty. but it it's felt like petty. it felt like sort of like the there wasn't literally nickel and diming you. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> for really things that are his fault. Really bizarre. Uh, and everyone seemed frustrated on the way out. Uh, all it of your fellow so tenants. It was just, it was so stressful. It was, I mean, I, there had been the instability and I'm lucky that, you know, I think that the people that I had as roommates um, were all good people and that made it easier, but it was, there was friction that came up because of the, the disrepair because of the neglect and it was just so frustrating to not have the stability of a home that would be taken care of where you knew you could you know I, I hosted Thanksgiving for family one year it was my first year doing that and and to not know if it would be honestly safe for some of my older relatives to get up the stairs because of just the the consistency of not finishing a project to the point of safety of insulation of sort of these these basic things was, it, it was stressful. So we're at the end, Julia. Uh, anything we haven't covered? Any closing thoughts? I am not trying to malign anyone. I just have concerns that the Scott's strengths were not highlighted in his role as a landlord with that kind of responsibility over people's well-being, over, over our safety, our comfort, you know, our sense of home. And I've been, I lived in Ward 7 there because of how the balance had changed at that time. I've never, you know, I've, I live in Ward 7. I care about Minneapolis. I'm just concerned that um, the patterns of the Scott's strengths do not, are not within the realm that I, are where's you're being too kind you use the phrase his strengths were not highlighted <laughs> to wrap this up <laughs> his strengths were not highlighted you have described some horrible conditions that you lived through so it's very kind of you to say his strengths were not highlighted <laughs> i am concerned that this that the role of city council member is outside of what is good for either the city of Minneapolis or honestly for Scott himself. He's not a kind or compassionate person, uh, at least in his role uh, with power over you and My your housing. My generous so I... interpretation would be that there was something extremely stressful about having even, you know, six people whose, whose homes he had some level of control and determination over. And under that pressure, he, he was kind of lashing out and, and not responding out of his best self. Not good at his job as a landlord and potentially not great in his job as a council member. I'm concerned. Okay. Julia Curran, my friend, thank you for telling me your story. This has been a weird episode for me to do, but I mean, it's good information. I hope people take it seriously. Uh, I hope so too. I, I want what's best for Minneapolis. Okay. Thank you. This has been the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. Thank you for listening. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.